Good afternoon. Today is September the 9th, 2020, and we are here with Dr. Sarah Trotty, who is a visual artist and fine arts educator in the city of Houston. She was the chair of the Texas Southern University Art Department and has recently retired in, within the last few years. And we're so grateful to have her join us in this discussion today about arts and arts education as social justice issues. Thank you so much, Dr. Trotty, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. You um, have a lot to bring to this conversation, having been an arts educator for, for such a long time now and having seen the shift in the Houston arts community, um, having been a participant as an arts administrator here, we value your input in this dialogue. And um, I'll start this interview as I have started others by asking uh, how you were exposed to the arts. Well, initially my exposure to the arts came as a young child. And probably like a lot of young people, it came from books, magazines. I first saw in a magazine an ad to complete a draw a man contest. And I took that contest, completed it, sent it in. I'm not even sure right now if I had my mom's permission to send it in. How old were you? I did. I was probably at that time about 12, you know, just going into middle school and discovering what I like to do. And I, I like to do drawings. I like to play with paint. Didn't have much paint, but I did like to do drawings. And one day, to my surprise, two men came up to our home in this little small town, West Texas town, with dark suits on and briefcases. Now, you know, this was a strange sight to see in a little black community. And um, they came, knocked on the door, talked to my mom, and told my mom that they were from a national uh, art uh, organization and that I had won a contest and hence a scholarship. Um, as scholarships go, that was something my mom had to pay for. <laughs> and with the house full of kids and a single mom, I didn't expect her to do that. But she found a way, she worked many jobs just to make sure that we had what we needed. And she decided that that was something important, I guess, because she signed that contract. In the mail, I started receiving books to read and learn about art, little pamphlets, complete assignment and send it back. And I actually did that. It seems like it took about a year or two, but I know I did it. And um, to this day, I kept wondering, why did she do that <laughs> when there are other things that could have been done? But she did. And um, then at some point after that, a neighbor moved in across the street. This was a young man um, with a family, and he was a self-taught artist. Mm -hmm. Later on, he did go to a junior college and pick up some classes. But he did allow me to come over and watch him paint. He was a good painter and I was impressed. So I knew that one day I wanted to be an artist. Of course, that wasn't something that was ever in my community. Our little small one house school had everything from before kindergarten was such a thing. Preschool through 12th grade in one building. And the teacher who was the elementary teacher, the, the principal's wife would take the kids in and teach them just as if they were students because the parents had to work. So we learned so much in that school. It was just a remarkable experience, but we did not have art. We had history and English and math and science. And I loved history and I thought, well, I'll be a history teacher because I love these teachers as well. And uh, they were just good people, really good family. Well, our schools integrated 
by the time I was to turn, move into the 11th grade. And I had my first opportunity to take an art class. Of course, when I saw that on the curriculum and I had a chance to select it, I did. And the teacher, a German experienced, was really very, very good. I never will forget her name, Miss Warman. And she allowed us to do a number of things. I got to paint, I got to draw. I mean, we actually had easels in the room. Imagine that, for me, that was a, quite an experience. And we did some things with clay and all those. And so I knew that I was gonna be an art teacher. So my decision then was, if it, I didn't make it as an art teacher, then I would be a history teacher because I love both of those two things. And I even had an opportunity in my senior year to do a little two or three day intern at a high school from that class where I was I actually taught a class. And it was the greatest experience I had as a high school, I think. And as a result of that, this I guess it was a local teachers organization gave me a scholarship. I think it was $250, whatever it was, it was a lot of money then. It was enough to pay for my tuition <laughs> for at least the first year. Maybe not buy the books and things, but it was, it was good. So I went on to University of Houston and that was a year of integration in our little small town. We integrated before a lot of the major cities did. So, in 1963, our schools integrated without too much ado. You know, there was some things said that made us a little afraid to go to the majority white school. Mm -hmm. But we went and we found some good teachers and we found some that we needed to steer clear of. Um, I knew that the, the principal at my school had taught us all how to play music. And so all of us were good at music. And my brother who played trombone, he was a year older than me and myself, played clarinet. I wanted to be in the band. We both wanted to, but the band teacher would not allow us to even try out. And as it goes, this principal was so good at music, he even had CDs made, tapes at that time. And he was really recognized for what he did. And he was a great mathematician. So he taught us all good math and it was just a good experience there. But anyhow, fast forward, University of Houston. I went there in 1965, majored in art education, had a really good experience there with the teachers and um, the whole opportunity. I did it in a short period of time. I actually finished in three years because I wanted to get to work and help out at home. Mm -hmm. And so I did. And I started teaching that first year, which was a great uh, experience. Oh, let me not forget to mention, I was what one of Houston's first uh, teachers call, called crossover teachers. I don't know if you heard that term. No. But the crossover teachers were the way that the Houston Independent School District solved integration. They started by putting predominantly teachers from predominantly uh, black schools in the white schools and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or in my case, if you were just graduating and you came highly recommended, you got a chance to go to the school. So I was, I was plopped right into a Jewish community school to begin my first year of teaching. And um, I did, had some good experiences there. And believe it or not, that was in 68. So Houston was just going through its integration at that time. Mm -hmm. What grade levels did you teach initially? Well, it was called junior high school at the time. So I taught seventh, eighth, and sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth grade, actually. Later on, they started separating them out to middle school and high school. Mm -hmm. But I did that for six years before I went on to grad school. Do you ever have any aspirations of becoming just an artist rather than, I would say just an artist, but a professional artist as opposed to an arts educator? No, I understand your question very well. And I certainly did have that interest. I actually uh, applied to uh, a school, actually in North Texas State, um, to be in, because they had one of the best programs then mm -hmm. in art. But my background was art education. So I had to pick up some classes 
to, to go into the fine arts, which I was glad to consider doing so. And I was already working as well. So I had to kind of think about, well, are you going to quit working and go to school? Or are you going to work and try to go into summers? So my decision was maybe summers. And as things go, the summer I was thinking about going, I actually ended up going to the Midwest and went to graduate school because I had my master's at that time. So I went on to Purdue. And that's where I decided I'd stay in and um, in art education at the higher level. But I did. I had that uh, desire to go on and do the fine arts um, option. Did you become a painter or would you have um, would you have become a, a painter or a sculptress or what, what, were, what was your focus? You know, as art educators, we, we become jacks of all trade. You know, you do a lot of everything. Mm -hmm. I always enjoyed watercolor and I like to do drawings. And so those would have been the areas that I would have started. You know, I did enjoy working with ceramics and eventually I would paint and draw on the ceramics, kind of like a watercolor type um, experience and I would do the watercolors and those became the areas of the medium in which I worked the most. That and collage, mixed media. So that's it's so interesting um, how parallel actually our own, our experiences are. Of course, I didn't go into arts education, but I mean, there's some art in, <laughs> in the way that I do things in the classroom. Um, but, but ultimately you became uh, an arts administrator uh, which is not too far of a departure from arts education. You know, you're still educating, but just a different group and about somewhat different subjects. So how did you transition into that arts administration arena? Well, let me go back to how I even decided to go into higher ed. Okay. I was actually working on my master's in um, education with an art emphasis under Dr. Biggers and Carol Harris Sims. Mm -hmm. And in one of the education courses, I think it was Dr. Thornton, or someone who oh, was another professor who said, you know, you should go on and get your doctorate because we need young people who can go into the field and, and make a difference. And I hadn't thought about it until that point. So when I saw, again, I guess this magazine was something to look at. And when I saw in a magazine an opportunity to apply for a fellowship at Purdue, I applied. And once I got there again in art education, when I came back, the position at Texas Southern University was open. So I applied for that in the art department as chair of the art department. So I came to Texas Southern as chair of the art department. And over 31 years, uh, because we would serve and then reelect or we'd have to change over 31 years, I served maybe four times as department chair. I think the last few years it was acting chair as we were going through a transition. Mm -hmm. So how did you make the decision? Um, so certainly with, at the university level, you were a formal administrator, right? handling the, the structure of the program there, making sure that the curriculum was solid and, and diverse and all of that. Um, but then, or at, maybe at the same time, for a certain portion of time, you were also very active in the community and still are very active in the community with developing a nonprofit organization, co-founding that and serving in the capacity of arts administrator in a more global sense, you know, working with the university still, but, you know, um, focusing your efforts in other ways outside of the university. So how did that happen? Well, it happened in part because Michelle Benson Barnes and I had met at the University of Houston when I was a senior, I believe, and she was probably um, a rising junior. She's probably going to become a senior the next year. And I met her when she was working in the ceramics lab in the student center. So we became fast friends very interested in some of the same things. And uh, so fast forward to the future, you know, we would go in and out of each other's lives, but we stayed in touch in a way. Fast forward uh, when I returned um, 
to Houston and to the art department at Texas Southern University, I had a chance to, to reunite with Michelle. And we had this discussion about women and art. And we ourselves knew that there were so many women out there who wanted to produce art, but women had so many roles to play. Mm -hmm. They were caregivers, their children, they had the families, they worked. And with all of this, how were they going to be able to be, to produce art at a level uh, where they could be in exhibitions and have a real exhibition career? So we thought we could help in some way. And Barnes Blackman was already in existence with some good exhibitions and mostly men artists. And that also helped us come to this conclusion that we would do something to get women more engaged. Mm -hmm. And so we started doing exhibits. We would find out about the women and we would talk to them about it and we would curate the shows. We took them on the road to Shreveport and other places. And we would have them at Barnes Black. And then we started the Community Artists Collective as a result of that. I filed for the 501c3. And when it was granted, we started our program. Over the years, you evolve. And before long, we were serving that need because we're educators, right? Serving that need to find art or make sure that art was available to all people. And so we were very open to the community, hence the name Community Artist Collective. We reached out to, in, in terms of participating in festivals and um, inviting people to come up and have gallery talks. And so it became a program where everybody could be engaged. And uh, I credit um, Michelle, and I still say this for for really doing the real work, making sure it happened. And I was there to support as much as I can because uh, I didn't quit my day job and she did. <laughs> she really put her heart into that. And we, it, it worked. And so we've stayed committed to this over 33 years. We have seen the reputation of the collective grow. There's so many things that we can do and we've seen women and not just women, but we've seen women grow and come through the collective and we've seen young male artists come through and grow at the collective. Some starting at very young ages and moving on to successful careers in the arts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So many students have been exposed to art through the collective, particularly in the summer camp programs and the after school programs. I know that you and, and Michelle Barnes have worked in concert with the school districts and uh, with CUNY homes and you know, just lots of other, wherever gaps are. Yeah. Where, yeah. Go ahead. So many collaborations with all the community organizations mm -hmm. and anywhere there was an opportunity to provide art opportunities, the collective was there. Mm -hmm. So before we look at just a few pictures, um, from the campus of Texas Southern, you talked to us about the great work that you were instrumental in doing with the historical murals that were there. Um, this larger discussion that we're having about art and the importance of arts education as a social justice issue, I think is part of what you just talked about um, that the collective and you and Michelle Barnes have been doing. Exposing youth at a young age and understanding that the formal curriculum has somehow disallowed a generation or more of students from really experiencing the kinds of formative exposures that you said that you got not in school. I mean, you weren't in school when you got that either. And somehow all these years later, not all these years, like to try to, but you know, some, some, some years later, when student, you, we would think that that education systems have evolved enough to understand the import of, of fine arts in general that um, it, it's just tragic. I don't, I don't know if I'm, I'm overemphasizing that, but in my mind, it's tragic that students don't have as consistent an ability or a consistent set of opportunities to be exposed to the arts in a way that would really help them not just see themselves, but see the world in a way that would just open up the possibilities for their living more richly, more robustly, um, 
and more communally, right? Everybody's so connected to the phone, so connected to technology, but disconnected to the human experience that, um, what do you think about, what are your thoughts on that? Well, let me just explain. One of the courses that I taught at the university, and I enjoyed teaching that because it gave you an opportunity to, to see many students, not just the students who said they wanted to major in art, but we taught a course called Fine Arts in Daily Living. And in that course, students were required to have that as a humanities requirement. Well, it didn't take long to discover that most of these students had not been exposed to any art. If there was art in their homes, it was one of the religious pictures, posters that was cut out and put in a frame and hung in their house or across. But that was about it. And even though they were on campus, they didn't know much about the art that was on the campus. They'd walked through Hannah Halls, they'd seen the murals, and many of them thought, well, um, why are they so dark? Or what, are, you know, what do they mean? So one of the projects that we had to accomplish in that class was to learn to write about art. Once they had the terminology and understanding, and then so much of the work that they've discovered reflected the civil rights era, because these art students who were there at TSU, who had to do a mural for part of their requirement, talked about their experiences, talked about their lives, talked about their communities. That's what Biggers and Sims had them to do, is to tell their own stories. So their stories told of the struggle. And then students began to see that when they used the flag or they, in their work as a symbol or a cross, or chains, that they were talking about things that happened in this United States. And they were communicating visually through symbols and colors, the expressions of true experiences. And so these students then had some tools and they were able to talk about the art themselves. And the murals were the best way for them to begin to do that. And it was right there under their fingers. You just did not know that they were exposed to it. So likewise, when the museum opened up, one of the things they had to do was to go to those exhibits at the museum and write about those. And from that, I found that many students became exposed to art. And the next thing I did is say, okay, we have to get outside of this campus. So we went to the museum of Fine Arts Houston. We'd go to some of the other galleries around town so that they could see art in other places and they could see that art was a way of expressing, whether they're expressing the struggle, their experiences, uh, their opportunities, you had to be able to show something. So when you chose your palette, your palette helped you get the theme the emotion, the feelings that you were going to express. And all these great murals, just as the biggest murals is shown here, and they had to write about the biggest mural. That was certainly one of the ones that they did. After they looked at all the student murals, then they had to go to the student center and write about Dr. Bigger's mural. And find the pattern, find the color, find the expression that's reached through seeing how those were put together. And so there was a great opportunity for the students right there on the campus. And what I discovered is that many wanted more art classes and some of them would take an art history class. And there were a few, and I told them, I, <laughs> one of the things I'd say to them, I'll know when this class means something to you because I'll see you out in the community. And it won't because I made, be because I made you go in terms of an assignment you went on your own. And I've seen students now who are uh, with companies uh, that had a chance to be there, or they just show up at the museum and they see me and they'll say, oh, I was in your class. And that's really one of the great experiences that they remembered that and it did reach them. It gave them a chance to see something because the arts of our times will tell what we experience during those times. It's just one of those things that's very, very important. 
So for our viewers, a lot of viewers won't know that this mural, this huge mural is in the cafeteria of Texas Southern University. Is this, right, this is the one that's in the- uh, It's called Family Unity and it's in the student center. And it actually shows that tie between experiences in the motherland and experiences in the communities mm -hmm. of America, certainly the American South, where everybody came together uh, because of the love and the strength that was there, despite uh, some of the obstacles that might be there. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I, I forget how much art there is on the campus. Um, you know, I will direct my students to the Hannah Hall, which is the administrative building, um, or I will, you know, ask them if they know where the bigger center is and direct them there on the, uh, right on the edge of campus. But er art is everywhere. It's, ev it's to be found everywhere on campus. There are a number of sculptures there as well as the University Museum. Mm -hmm. And the, the lobby itself of the Biggers building is actually a gallery of its own. It shows so much of the art that the students have made over the years. And uh, the students also have a contemporary area where they show the work that they're completing um, in real time, mm -hmm. as well as some of the pieces that are uh, historic pieces of all the artists who've passed through that through the university. Mm -hmm. So I understand, uh, just based on my conversations with you, you caused me to remember the fact that uh, the restoration effort of those murals that were in the administration building that you led, championed actually, the effort to have those student murals in Hannah Hall restored. Um, tell us a little bit about, I don't have a great image, but tell me, tell us if you will, just a little bit about the Hannah Hall murals and the, the um, what, what was that initial project and why was it so important for you that the university restore the murals in that building? Partly the experience of living with those murals, teaching from those murals in a number of the classes, of course, if the students who were not majors were taken to those murals to learn something about how expression in, is done visually. Mm -hmm. Our majors, our art majors went to the Hannah Hall and other places to see the murals that were done before them because they each had to do a mural. Well, over time, these murals did begin to deteriorate, especially some of those on the third floor and the second floor. The earliest murals there were done in 1950, right after a lot of the uh, young men in the military came back and had an opportunity to go to school on the GI Bill. So some of those murals reflected their experiences and they ex expected respect, I'm sorry, they reflected their experiences during segregation. Mm -hmm. Because you know, at that time in 1950, all the way up to in Houston to 70s, uh, Houston was not integrated. And so they told these stories of hope and aspiration and of struggle. And uh, they would go back and tell stories about from Africa to now, because Biggers was a griot and he and Sims both would talk to them about their experiences. And many of them would do the research, they'd learn about it and even our majors, when I was there, they had to do research before they could do a mural. If they wanted to do a topic and they wanted to talk about an experience, they had to know what they were talking about. And, and then work with uh, some of the communities, go out and draw the houses and draw the railroad tracks and draw the people in the community and put their stories together. Mm -hmm. And so we had to say this, this was a legacy that had to be preserved. Some of the murals were in fairly decent shape and ima imagine these murals are so close that anybody can touch them. But they weren't oh, you go. in a way they weren't destroyed. Students didn't scratch them up and mess them up. 
but they deteriorated because the paint would peel a little bit at an exposure to the water fountains and exposure to the hallways, the doorways. And so this history had to be saved. And so one of the things that um, we did was to try to find ways. We started a committee of uh, professionals who wanted to help save the murals. That's what we call them, save the murals. And we started drawing attention to the fact and looking for opportunities to get grants to do some conservation. And eventually we were able to get some support for that. And the great thing about it is that our students were able to learn through the conservationists what you needed to do to protect your own work when you're making and creating, but also if works needed it, what it took to restore them, to preserve them. And so uh, one of our students, and I don't want to start calling names, but mm -hmm. Lestarsha McGarity mm -hmm. was one who was able to follow some of the conservationists around as they were restoring the murals and learn. And she realized she had to take a lot of chemistry as well as art, but it took, she did what it took to learn how to be a conservator. And now she is with the Smithsonian, I might mention. That's amazing. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Um, so I had a picture here of um, the, some of, of Dr. Bigger standing in the hallway with some of the students who created certain of the murals. And it looks as though they're on the second floor of Hannah Hall. Um, how much education of administrators did you have to do <laughs> or with them to get them to buy into the idea that this kind of restoration was, was really important? That was a huge problem. I, I never will forget the day that we came. I walked into the Hannah Hall and there were signs glued uh, on the murals next to the doors. And this is one of those examples that you showed. Mm -hmm. But there were signs that told you which office was there. And we thought, you can't do that. Nobody even asked. <laughs> uh, so we had to start a petition. We had to explain to our administrators that this would deface the mural because you then could not take the sign off without destroying the mural. So there was quite a bit of education and we'd had to tell them they couldn't just tape up, people would tape up signs on the murals. So there was a lot we had to do, but given all of that, the murals were in fairly good condition. I know Dr. Biggers had his struggles in the past with murals being taken out sometimes just to put in a uh, another space. Uh, so there was, we struggled with that over the years as well, even under my uh, chairmanship. But I think that it, we tried to get over the point how important these murals are. And they are historically significant. They are definitely historical signif historically significant. And it's something that not only important to the university, but important to the community as a whole. I, you know, I say this, we have the largest collection of murals in any particular one venue, um, in one spot there on the campus, in, when you compare it to other institutions in this country. And so it's a legacy that has to be preserved, a legacy now that is historically significant. So it's one of the things we want to really work to preserve. Well, I am really looking forward to your joining the group of artists that I've gotten together. I hope that, um, you know, I, I know that you know many of them and either have worked with them directly or they, um, they praise you for being so supportive of them and their career, help, helping to usher in their career um, by providing space through Barnes Blackman or through the collective. And is there any, as we wrap up our discussion today, is there any, I guess if you could appeal to contemporary administrators who are on the fence 
about, and I, I mean, in the formal education settings in schools, if you could appeal to them to impress upon them the importance of the arts, you know, if they're wrestling with their respective budgets and trying to determine how best to allocate funds, what might you say to convince them that would persuade them to put aside a little bit of funding for the arts? I would say to any administrator who has an opportunity to hire art teachers, to make sure that the youth have an opportunity to be exposed to the arts, especially visual art, don't waste that opportunity. It has been shown that if you give a young person an opportunity to express themselves, and art is one of those ways to do that. I mean, we have many forms of communication. Of course, you know that English and literature is important, but all of these are forms of communication. We begin to communicate visually at a very young age. And we only stop because somebody says that you're not count talented or capable. And we miss a part of overall expression that's so important in being able to communicate. Understanding visual cues, very important in everything that we do. Paying attention to detail, looking for symbolic meaning. All of these things are important. And we know from experience, the first thing to go when the budgets are tight would be the art class. And that's where we do the most harm because that's where students are freer to express themselves, to be able to say something on paper or canvas, whatever is available to them in a way that they are not threatened. They are pulling out what's inside. And we need not to disenfranchise any person of an opportunity for visual expression. We know from all the work that's being done now, all the murals that have popped up all over the place, everybody is finding a way. You don't have to be the most talented in, to express yourself visually. You just have to have the desire and the opportunity. And I would say to anyone, do not deny the opportunity for self-expression. It's one of the most important keys to socialization because once we're able to get that out in a form, whether it's visual or otherwise, then we are able to understand ourselves even better and to understand others. We may not have as much strife if we just stopped and talked about what we were doing, took the time to share what an object means, a, a visual expression means, and how that applies to life. It does apply to life, by the way. Everything that we do visually has as its key an expression of, of that particular individual's experience in life. And so when the artist speaks, the visual artist speaks, they're speaking in the format that they use to say to the world, this matters. It matters to me, but it matters to a lot of people. Just listen. So I would say to administrators, just listen. Make art available to everyone. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that and, and for giving so generously of your time this afternoon. Um, I look forward to your joining us again in October for the Samuel DeWitt Proctor Institute's panel discussion. And we'll continue our dialogue about the relationship between arts, arts education, and uh, social justice matters. Thank you, Dr. Trotty. Thank you.